Greetings from Manitouish Waters, and uh, this is Jim Boker with K. Kranz, and uh, I just want to introduce today the uh, State House Lake Life and Contributions of the YCC. This will be a presentation done by K, and I will be handling some of the mechanics behind the scenes. So if it gets a, a little Quirky, uh, we ask for your patience, but I think you're going to find this to be an exciting presentation. We ask you to please uh, keep your um, computers on mute and uh, you can leave questions in the chat as you uh, need to. And um, we would be very happy to uh, go over those at the end of the presentation. So without any further ado, I am going to turn this over to Kay. Well, hi, everybody. I'm so glad to be able to present tonight. I've been really interested in the youth conservation camp at Statehouse Lake ever since I, I was teaching high school and some kids needed a project and they wanted to learn about this area of uh, history in, in the Manitouche Waters region. So I guess you can't begin talking about Statehouse Lake without talking about Gaylord Nelson. You know, Gaylord was from Clear Lake, Wisconsin, and he was an outstanding environmentalist, but he grew up in a family whose parents taught him the history behind Wisconsin's great, great legacy of environmentalism. He learned about the, the, the progressive area. He learned about that time before, um, before people realized how valuable all our resources were. He learned about the, the people that came before him like E.M. Griffith. And he was on an airplane ride um, in the early 60s and he, he began to think about um, the sit-ins that were going on and about the war in Vietnam. He goes, gosh, we could have a sit-in about the environment. And he created Earth Day. But while governor of Wisconsin, he began um, thinking about how people since World War II had been talking in the Wisconsin State Assembly and in the US Congress about why can't we bring back the legacy of the Civil Conservation Corps. Why can't we bring back a program that's modeled after that? And so with all kinds of hard work and diligence, the um, Wisconsin State Assembly, one of the first states, there were two states that began a Youth Conservation Corps program. And Wisconsin was the leader. And we passed the um, Outdoor Recreation Action Program in 1961. And that set aside the ability to buy with $60 million, a hundred, I mean, a million acres of wild land, uh, new land for parks and recreation, and the creation of a youth conservation corps. Only instead of centering on young adults, we're settled, settling on old adolescents, kids age 16 to 19 years of age. And in the later years, the age was taken down to 15. Well, how are we gonna do this? They gotta sit down and plan this program and they choose one campsite to start the Youth Conservation Corps. And guess what? It was Statehouse Lake right here in our own area. And why was it here? Well, if you look at the, the history behind our area, it's just a no brainer. We're in the middle of the Northern Highlands uh, state Forest, um, Northern Highlands American Legion State Forest. And we've got a great um, core of uh, DNR men who are ready and willing to help with this program. So Gaylord Nelson gave us the inspiration and the guidance. And then when he goes on to become US Senator, he keeps pushing this mo movement. And soon um, he and others in the federal government are able to create a federal youth conservation corps. Now, when we created our first camp at Statehouse Lake, it was followed by Nancy Lake, which became the Ernie Swift YCC. 
and then the Meccan River YCC in southern Wisconsin, and then finally the Kettle Moraine YCC. But tonight we're really going to focus on that Statehouse Lake YCC. Um, what was its mission? Its mission was to provide constructive employment. How are we going to get kids to understand the land ethic and conservation without an experience? So where are we going to go? We're going to go to high school principals and high school counselors, and we're going to say, hey, guys, I need kids, and I need kids that really are interested in the natural resources. So in the first year at Statehouse Lake, Within a nine month period, 200 kids were accepted to come to Statehouse Lake in the first year of operation, which was 1962. Now here you see a, a picture of actually a young girl who is using a double-edged ax to cut down her trees. And then you see some kids working on, on um, stabilizing stream improvement. Now think about this, they could use no power tools. So all the work that was completed at these camps was done with hand tools. Oh, we're having trouble, there we go. Now, what were the goals? Okay, you wanna give them a summer experience and you wanna make them understand what it is to work hard. Now, when you are working in conservation, it sounds good when you're walking around on a on a high school campus talking about you really care about the environment, but you don't understand how much work is gonna be involved. Sweat, tears, mosquito bites, tick bites, and exhaustion. And those boys and girls learned that at this camp. <laughs> they, learned it, they learned a lot of lessons about that. And they were supposed to learn to become self-reliant and leaders. And a lot of these kids reached those goals in their lives. So this is a this uh, slide is a picture of the conservation um, application form, and I remember um, one of the campers. His name was Thor Sandy. He just passed away, unfortunately, but he came to camp in 1965, and he came to camp every summer of his life until 1981. He went from being a camper to an assistant director. But I got a little story to tell you about him. He's sitting there in his high school world history class. And the counselor comes over the loudspeaker and says, hey, wanna go to camp? Wanna get paid and learn about your environment and become a worker for our state? And he goes, wow, I don't have anything to do this summer. I'm signing up and it changed his life. Uh, this picture is an interesting picture. These boys are standing outside in the middle of the night and I believe they're in their underwear and they're being disciplined, and this was called mosquito patrol. They were made to stand outside and let the mosquitoes bite them if they'd done something really that the camp director didn't like. But you see here the basic camp rules, which are good rules today. No drugs, weapons, you know, let's, let's not fight, let's not steal, and let's leave each other alone. And then we had to figure out how are we gonna get counselors? Well, we've got the University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point, two hours south of Statehouse Lake. And a lot of the guys were majoring in natural resources, found this a great summer employment. So the counselors became um, very uh, well-trained in the natural resources and also gained a great place on their vita to say that they had done this. But when we're talking about a great council, we're gonna talk about what did this camp consist of administration wise? We had a director, we had an assistant director, we had a environmental education director, we had 10 counselors and two cooks. So those were the adults at the camp. But the counselors were really led to be important parts. They were the important niche between the Wisconsin Conservation Department and the kids. So they had to be understanding, they had to care about the kids, and they had to also really understand that they had to keep these kids safe while they're working in the woods. Now here's our camp director. And Mr. Brismaster 
was known as a strict disciplinarian. <laughs> strict disciplinarian was a serious business. But why was he like that? Well, he was a member of the Mighty Eight during World War II, and he flew um, photo reconnaissance out in front of um, the bombers that would come later. And he knew how important it was to be able to trust who you were flying with or working with and to be safe. And that's the way he led his camp. And he believed that he had believed in that military um, boot camp experience to get kids to understand who they were and to also become comrades with the other with the other kids. And um, the the men and women that we have met, um, Jim and I have met a lot of YCC kids, kids, they're all old people now or getting older. And and many of them that had an experience with Bristmaster have extremely fond memories and many say they he changed their lives. Now, so he's the disciplinarian, but he also has very lofty plans for this camp. Now this camp was empty. It had to be built. Now who was gonna build the camp? The campers. So we've got the DNR uh, carpenters come into this camp to work on first building tents, and then building cabins, and then building the director's house. So you imagine 16 to 18 year olds and later 15 year olds are actually building the camp itself. Uh, this is just a, an article in the newspaper after Bristmaster passed away. But he, he said one day, he's like, understand why these kids like to go to these fancy camps where their parents pay six hundred thousand dollars to go to camp he said i got the best camp up here and the kids are getting paid to go to that camp well i don't know if the camp if the other camps work the kids quite as hard as our camp did but they sure learned a lot about the forest he was also a professor at the university um, of wisconsin at oshkosh and he was in um, the speech department and he loved um, music. He, did, he worked with a lot of musicals at Oshkosh. And so classical music was often paid, played across the loudspeakers at Statehouse Lake. Now the picture you see here is a, the circle is Thor Sandy who went on to become an assistant director. And Jim and I were able to interview him and his wife last summer, just before he passed away. But he not only came to this camp, but he met his wife here. His wife, Marty, was a dietitian and starting her graduate program um, in, di in dietetics and came to work as an assistant cook at the camp one summer when he was um, working and they fell in love. And Brismaster made sure the next summer she was assigned to the Ernie Swift camp because he felt like maybe there was a little too much romance going on. But you see all these young, these young men, these older guys, I don't know if any of them are in the audience tonight, but these are campers from the 60s that still and 70s that still get together every summer of their lives. Now, the Wisconsin idea of a YCC became so important that as Gaylord got involved in government and other US senators, they began to push for a United States uh, Youth Conservation Corps, and in um, uh, in the late, later 19, you know, well, it was 1971, Frank, uh, Richard Nixon signed into law, public law 91378 that created the Federal Youth Conservation Corps, which still exists today. So after, in the 70s, we've got two programs going with a state program, and we've got a federal program. So now you've got more kids working in the forest. You've got federal kids working in the Shawamigan Nicolay, and then you have our state kids, our, our kids from the high schools here working at State House. This is just a great picture. Um, when we were working on a federal youth conservation corps, Statehouse Lake became the model to base the writing of the bill to create, create the federal camps. And these are professional 
photographs taken by the Wisconsin De Department of Natural Resources. And it's right there in the parking lot at State House Lake. Here's a more informal picture of the staff from one of the summer sessions. And you'll see the older man on the right with the cigar in his mouth is Brismaster. You see all the counselors and the women are the cooks. And of course, if you were a counselor, you were allowed to bring your dog with you for the summer experience. So when the first camp starts in 1962, the kids arrive and they are housed in a few, in a few tents, but then they go on to help the um, carpenters from the DNR build the frames to put up all the tents. And we had 10 to 12 uh, boys at the first, the first camps were only boys um, living in these tents. One kid showed up at camp and he said, I can't believe it. I feel like I'm seeing a mash show because these are old military um, tents. So from 62 to 1965, the camp is only tents. And then you see on the right in this um, slide, the, the barracks that were built by the kids. And the kids, um, there were 10 kids to each barrack and they were named um, Redhead and uh, Green Teal or whatever, but they all have different names and the names are still there at the North Lakeland Discovery Center today. But what I think is cool is that um, when you lived in a, in a barrack, there was a whole lot of pride centered around your dormitory area. And um, there were awards given every week for the camp that was kept, I mean, the, the cabin that was kept the neatest and the most dressed up. And um, one of the rewards was that you could choose what work detail you worked on, which was a big deal because there were a lot of work, deal, work details that were not fun. And guess where you really wanted to get work detail? Detail. You wanted to work on the streams, the uh, riparian repair of the the of the <laughs> of the stream beds, and that way you could go swimming and get away from the mosquitoes a little bit. Okay, now we've got a former camper who has a few words to say about camp. Randy Bohan. Now you see the campus as it was in the early days. And if you go out to the North Lakeland Discovery Center to do it today, and you look at that same um, picture, or you picture it in your mind, it's still pretty much the same looking from this direction. And the kids um, built all that structure. Now, what did they do during the day? They were sent out in a uh, cruise and they worked in different areas. <laughs> and uh, one of the biggest travel times was to Copper Falls State Park. And the kids loved that because they had to sit in the truck for a long time and it took away from their working hours. So they felt like they were you know, getting treated to not having to do too much those days. But somebody figured out, well, why don't we have an outpost camp? And so the state, um, the, the Madison guys at the DNR said, yep, next summer we'll have outpost camps. So those kids don't have to sit in the car and not work. Here's a, a picture of Cambers in the 70s. Now you look how formal, much more formal, the attire is and their hair is shorter. Now you look into the 80s and things are becoming more and more relaxed at camp. And by the time you get into the 90s, that military discipline style has faded away. You notice this camp is called, on the left is called Redhead and then we've got Badger Cabin on the right. 
Now, this is the typical work day, and it went that way day after day after day. Now, how long do the kids stay at camp? Well, they in the beginning, there were six-week sessions, two sessions a summer. But as um, athletics and sport team sports became more and more important to practice in the summers at the high schools in our state, the camp uh, sessions got small, shorter and shorter. And by the 90s, we only had four week, two four-week sessions. But if you look at this work week, they're going to work from 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m., and they have a few breaks and a 45-minute lunch. Well, what, what did lunch consist of? Well, they had a packed lunch every day, and they ate, they ate honey and peanut butter sandwiches every day, and the second sandwich was always a meat item. They had soup. They had a choice of milk or bug juice, they called it, which was probably like our Kool-Aid that we remember when we were kids. But they always, most of the boys or men that we've interviewed and women always say they were fed very well. And then you look at after they get back to camp, generally before dinner, everyone had to clean up. And the most popular way to clean up was to strip down and jump into State House Lake and take a swim. Now on those cold rainy days, they came back and they saunaed in the nice warm sauna and swam before dinner. Here's a picture of Frida Brayer and she was known to all the campers as Ma. She's in the center of the picture with two helpers. She was a beloved lady and um, one of the interviews that you're gonna see next talks about what she did for one nice young man at camp. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get our audio through on the last one. I increased it on my computer, so hopefully this will work better. You're getting nothing. All right, so we'll just go on. Okay, Mr. Annan was telling us about being at Copper Falls and catching trout. And he actually caught trout with his hand and he had been on, on good terms with uh, Ma Brayer and he brought the trout back to camp and she especially fried up that trout for him so he'd have a great meal that night. Now, this is a picture of KP, two pictures of KP duty. Now, there's, there's different ideas about whether KP was a good deal or a bad deal. Some kids would say they worked harder on KP duty than they did when they worked out in the fields. And other guys would say, oh, I really liked it because I could stay back at camp and I could get a few breaks. But anyways, they worked really hard. And here you see a bunch of boys uh, peeling potatoes for dinner. And you see that great big, it looks like a 50 pound sack of potatoes. And then you see the other guys cleaning up after dinner. Now, this was introduced to the boys. This meal was introduced to the boys very early on. And if any of you have ever been in the military, you know what this is called in the military, but it's chip, chipped beef on toast. Well, in the beginning, some of the boys would be spoiled and they'd complain about the food, but they were supposed to eat everything on their tray. But by the middle of camp, everybody ate everything on their tray because they had worked so hard, they were starving. Now, this is how you got your work assignment. At Statehouse Lake, that board was in um, the um, rec center or the dining hall. And uh, every Monday morning, you had to go and pick your name off the board and see what your job was. And you see the quote on our slide, you, everyone loved or loved to hate a Monday morning, depending on what you got. Now, this uh, sauna was built by the kids. So they got the experience of building a real log cabin. But what's interesting about this is um, Brismaster, who you see on the left on the beach, which is a beach at Lake Superior, 
the boys went up on their off time and they collected rocks to build um, the infrastructure of that log cabin, the base. But how did they get the cement slab to put that sun on? One day there was a, a cement truck driving right down Highway 51 going towards Mercer from Manaqua. And um, there was a turnover of that cement truck and all the concrete went right into the highway. Well, Brismaster heard about it and he got a bunch of guys, counselors down there and he went and he talked to the driver and he said, if we can get this concrete mix up off the uh, highway, can we have it? The guy says, take all you want. And that's how they built the um, foundation for the sauna. The boys also built the dock at State House Lake and it was all built with uh, log crib cribbing. Again, they're learning all these cool skills that will take them through their lives. And this is a really important story to the State House Lake legacy. If, you, if you've been on the campus, you see this building and it is very much in disrepair. This building has traveled over many miles. It was a uh, Civil Conservation Corps barracks, outpost barracks up near Palmer Lake during the Great Depression. The um, Wisconsin Conservation Department moved it to Rhinelander, was there at Rhinelander, used as a barracks for a while, and then later became commissioned to be a store storeroom. Well, Brismaster heard that they were gonna um, take this building apart and destroy it. So he contacted officials and asked if they could not bring this to State House Lake. And this became the boys rec hall and PX. And it's a great story because um, he didn't just create this, the boys had to remodel it, fix it up. And then they also had to buy all the things inside. So if they wanted a jukebox, the boys had to figure out how to buy it. They wanted a pool table, they had to figure out how to buy it. So on their off hours on Saturdays and Sundays, they would take jobs in town. They would go and rake somebody's yard or, or take people's stuff to the dump for them. And they got the money and they created this great rec room. It also had a library in it and a lot of the books in the library. One of the former campers, Matt Blessing, always talked about, that's where he was really into introduced to some great environmental literature. Um, and here you have the outfit. This is what the boys went into the woods to work with. You see the um, double-headed ax and the Swedish uh, swing blade, and then the uh, water tanks. This is the kind of equipment that the boys used. Nothing power. They'd work at cutting down trees all day long with those double-edged axes, or they'd brush out of area at the Paul Marsh with those Swedish blades. And they'd work on fire protection with that water tank. This is a just, I love this picture because it just demonstrates young women learning how to use an ax. Now, when I was, 16, 17, and 18, no one showed me how to use an ax and I could have been a good fire person if I'd had it, I could have cut firewood. Okay, now, where, where are the boys working? Well, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources has um, certain specific calls. Trout Lake was the center for their parks and recreation. Forest protection and forest management were out of Mercer's Ranger Station. And game management and fisheries management were out of Woodruff. So all the DNR people are coming out of these various areas. They're working with the boys and girls, or they're teaching them on Fridays when they had academic time to learn academic stuff. I love this picture of this young man building a fish crib. That could be right on our chain of lakes in Manitowish waters. Um, and this was uh, 1966, one session. This is the stuff that the, the kids um, finished doing. 
Now think about that. You've got 100 teenagers. So they planted 30,000 white pines. They pruned 28,000 trees. They built 214 log fish cribs, and they built 17 miles of new trails. Have you ever hiked on the Escanaba Trail? Built by the YCC boys. Much of the pass at Copper Falls. Now, I just wanted to show you that uh, wall that was at State House Lake. Again, the boys did masonry work and they, they gathered more stones from Lake Superior and built this beautiful wall. If you see that, if you go to the amphitheater at the Discovery Center, you will notice um, rock wall there still that were left built by the boys. Um, Bristmaster's one important goal personally was that every boy would see an accomplishment by the end of his session that he had accomplished a really great thing either for camp or for the forest. Here's just a uh, forest management picture where they're hauling logs out of a cleared area that they've cut trees in. And here you see boys working in fisheries management. That we believe the picture on the left is right on Rest Lake. Here's the Manitowish River and they're working on stream improvement for the river and fish habitat. And here they're at the Paul Marsh. Now the boys would say that the Paul Marsh wasn't their favorite place to go because it was so quick getting there. So they were working hard from um, 8.30 to 4.30. But here you see them working on fire um, suppression and controlled burns. A lot of responsibility for a young group of boys and girls. Here's a picture of some young ladies um, cutting up some um, fallen tree timber to haul out of the woods. And I love this quote. Here's a young woman who's hauling a wheelbarrow out of the woods. Well, that picture happens to be boys, but <laughs> she's working so hard she doesn't even notice. She looks up from carrying that wheelbarrow and, and she looks up and dumps all her dirt when she is invited to shake hands with Gaylord Nelson who's coming to visit a work site. Now, Parks and Rec, uh, the picture on the right is the boys developed the whole beach at Crystal Lake. And they also developed um, campsites at the South Turtle Lake Campground, Firefly, Starrett Lake, um, many, many different areas. And they also were responsible for cutting and stacking firewood at the campsites. And here's a game management picture. We can't find out a lot of, of information on the game management and I don't know how much work they actually did, but here the boys are learning how to band um, Canadian geese. And this is back at camp. The boys are gathering. Um, they may be going out on a Saturday. They got to go to town. Um, they either went to Manaqua or Mercer or Eagle River. Um, one of the things that was sad about the development of the Youth Conservation Corps camp is that when it was first introduced, the Department of Public Welfare was a partner with the Department of Natural Resources. And so people in the areas where the camps were started to think, well, these were um, welfare kids or, or delinquent kids, and that myth even slowed down the progress of getting new camp enrollees for a while until they reorganized they had the Kellogg Reorganization Act in Wisconsin, and they took the public welfare part out. Now, the only thing the public welfare did was do the administration of the food and supplies that were gonna be at these camps. So it never was that mission. Now, the volleyball field is a great story. Uh, again, Bruce Masters trying to get things done with very little um, budget. And they were working on uh, creating the volleyball sports area. And uh, the DNR had um, hired or contracted an outside contractor to create a blacktop road coming into camp. And so when the crew first arrived to do the job, 
First master invited them all for lunch in the dining hall and uh, sat down with them and said, you know, if you took about a quarter inch off the top of the plans with the, the amount of asphalt, do you think you could make a volleyball court um, pad and still nobody would notice that that road um, dimensions were changed? And the guy said, well, yeah, we can do that. And that's what they did. That's how he got his volleyball court. Now, at the end of the session or on the 4th of July, if they were kids were in the camp on the 4th, they had what they called it a wingding. And it was a whole day of competition and fun and skits and plays. And as you see here, people are getting dumped in the water. So that was a great time for the kids. They had a great experience with that. And I love this quote. This is a, a young woman um, named Norma Smiter. And I, to me, when I read it, it just really hit me. And I don't like to read off a slide, but I got to read this to you. And as I'm reading, think about this. I remember that campfire. And then I remember putting it out at the end of a solid day of work. And it sort of said, yep, my work is done today. And tomorrow I'm going to get up and do that work again. Be proud, be fulfilled, and be thankful. That's a high school kid. We'll see if this works again. Uh, I'm sure Frank will tell me if it does or not. This is Stephanie. All right, it seems like the uh, PowerPoint audio cuts out everything else. So we're just gonna go on. Well, I'm gonna tell you about Stephanie Wildly. I think Stephanie might even be on tonight, but she's, she's talking about um, her dad kind of saying, why do you wanna go to this camp? You'll never make it for four weeks. And that kind of became a challenge to her. And she went to camp and she fell in love with the outdoors. She fell in love with Northern Wisconsin. And she said, from then on, she was hooked on the North Woods. And to this day, she comes up camping and brings her kids with. And they're learning that wonderful land ethic through their mom. Now, this um, gentleman, Kermit Traska, came to State House Lake as a counselor. So he was already a junior in college. And then he went on to stay in the system and he became a director of Ernie Swift. And then he became a director at the Kettle Moraine. But then he went on to a 29 year career. He became the head of the Bureau of Parks and Recreation for the DNR um, at one of, the camp, one of the state parks. He was the lead in making sure that a Frank Lloyd Wright home at Mirror Lake was saved and to this day we can go and visit it. He just had an illustrious career. And where did that career start? Being a biology major and natural resources minor at Stevens Point, teaching for a while, getting involved in camp, and then going on to this great career for the state of Wisconsin. Now we have found oh, I don't know, probably 50 of these Christmas cards. And it just shows you what it was developed. It wasn't just a four week or a five week or a six week session. These people became lifelong friends, shared Christmas cards and just stayed in touch. This is just a example of what the boys or girls got at the end of camp. So it's a certification that they did it. They made a big contribution to Wisconsin. And then the last director of the YCC in Wisconsin, Ray Hendrixy, said that he believed that, you know, the DNR would have gone on, the DNR would have done projects, but without the YCC, so many things would never have gotten done. It might have gotten done after, in, you know, 40 years, but these boys moved and advanced our work in the forest. 
a hundredfold, a thousandfold. And today, what is so cool about that property is there were some people in the community and at North Lakeland Elementary School that said, you know, they saw an ad in the paper that the DNR wanted to rent out this property, this former YCC camp. And they said, you know, this is an opportunity. So they rented it. I, and I think they paid very little to rent it. And they created an environmental program through that elementary school, which today that legacy goes on at our North Lakeland Discovery Center, which has expanded to include all the people in the community and all the people that come to visit us. So it's a great, great legacy. So the boys are learning about the natural resources. The girls are learning about the natural resources. And then it goes on so that we're all still learning about the natural resources. Now I wanna talk about that CCC building that's sitting on that campus. You know, uh, the Manitou's Waters Historical Society and the North Lakeland Discovery Center have a dream that we would like to use that building, keep that building because it's a historical building, but create a, a forest history museum where People can come in, go through kiosks, learn about the Northern Highland American Legion State Forest, find out where there are places to go visit that they can learn more, and get on their bikes or drive their cars and go out into the forest and enjoy it. So that's a dream that we're working on right now, and uh, we're very excited about that. Okay, well, okay, thanks. We got about 40 minutes in on this presentation. So we will uh, open up questions for Kay. You can unmute yourself and uh, ask any questions um, that you might have. Has anybody got a question? Kay, it's Patience. Hi, so, Patience. Hi. So when you started out, it sounded like this was just a um, institution for boys. And when did the girls sneak in? Oh, that's a really good question. 19, well, when it became, when they created the federal youth program, one of the stipulations was it had to include females and minorities. So that was 1973. We had our first female camp and it was at, um, uh, was at the Kettle Moraine. <laughs> but by 1974, they had a co-ed camp. And uh, that must have been really interesting to, to run. Thank God I was <laughs> the counselor there. Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, this is Richard. Uh, I, We're I at a, each session. Pardon? How many campers were at the sessions? Oh, well, that's a good body. question. That's a hundred campers per session at each camp. Hey, you guys, have you got a second for me to tell you another story? When I just thought of, I just thought of this great story. You know, they all the camps had big bells, so they could call the guys to the um, dining hall. And Ernie Swift Camp was in Manong, which wasn't that far from State House. And one night, the Ernie Swift counselors came down to State House, and this Kermit Traska that I was talking to you about before, he was a counselor at the. Um, yeah, his his duty was to be in the office, and he slept there. He fell asleep, never heard of, never heard anything. And the boys from Ernie Swift stole stole the bell, but as they were driving out of State House Lake, there was a counselor that had gone to the Pea Patch Beer Bar and um, saw that a car was coming out late at night and they thought that was kind of odd. So they took down the license plate and um, they were able to trace it to Ernie Swift. Okay, so our bell gets returned. Well, the next summer, State House Lake decides the counselors are gonna go up to Manong and steal their bell. So they get up there, they park their car a fourth of a mile from the camp entrance so nobody can hear them. They go through the woods, they get to the bell and there's a padlock on the bell. 
So they, they came prepared, they sawed that padlock off the bell and then um, two boys held the bell, one boy held the clapper. And as they're going through the woods, one of the kids that's holding the clapper falls over and the whole bell clangs. But just at that moment, a huge burst of thunder hit. So nobody heard the bell clang. And then this incredible storm, here's these guys sneaking out of the woods and taking the bell back to State House Lake, which they were, they were caught and they had to return it. But those are kind of the fun things that went on. What was the last year the camp was open at State House Lake? Very good question. 1995, it was closed. The, 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 um, the camps were closed down. And that was, there were several reasons for that. One of it was um, that people were worried about um, lawsuits at that time in history. <laughs> you know, these guys are in the woods and they're, they're, they're capable of getting hurt badly. Um, also, the money was running out and that just wasn't a movement to keep it going, which was a really sad thing. A lot of the campers will say when they come talk to us is I wish my kids could have had this experience. Any other questions? Hi, Kay, it's Amy Stengley. Oh, hi, how are you? Uh, Good. I just wanted to say I went to Ernie Swift back in 19, probably 1990. Oh, great. Tell us about that. <laughs> Lee and I were just kind of laughing about stuff, but um, yeah, I mean, like the pictures from the 60s and stuff, we still had all the same equipment. Um, it was a lot of work. Um we did a lot of different jobs. We worked at a couple different state parks, Amnacon Falls and Patterson Park, up by Superior. Um, so a lot of, lot of experience, but we were kind of laughing about some of the stuff. And I was telling Lee, like when I went into camp, they just were transitioning out of that militaristic style. Uh -huh. Yeah. Actually, there, there was a lot of issues they were breaking a lot of child labor laws. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they, used, they used to use punishment and make people work like all night long doing like yes. cutting out stumps out of the ground and stuff like that. And, and actually that is a true story. <laughs> yeah, in the year before I was there, one of the counselors got pregnant or one of the campers got pregnant by a counselor. Not uh, good. <laughs> yeah. And their their motto was you 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 leave things better than you find them. So or if somebody left like a piece of paper somewhere at a park, like we would literally, if we stopped for lunch, we would get have to get on our hands and knees and do a line. And we'd clean the whole entire park, mm -hmm. you know, back mm -hmm. and forth. Mm -hmm. um, you know, pick I up remember picking up and everything. State oh, there's Stephanie yep. Wilding. Hi. Hi. Even at State House, I remember picking up cigarette butts in the park and things like that. <laughs> um, but I know, like, when I was there, too, given that it was 91, so it was just before they ended up closing, um, we were... So my biology teacher encouraged a group of us to go. And I was in the first session with one of my friends and then two other friends went to the second session that summer. But I think we were the only ones that were not court ordered to be there. <laughs> so it, it became- They were some, using some dis, dis, yes, delinquents. It <laughs> like kind of the kids before getting into some juvenile court stuff, like they would try to use that to deter them. So, I mean, it was, it was an interesting experience and you got to see people from all walks of life, that's for sure. <laughs> well, one of the stories of Bristmaster about the cigarette butt, he, he, was, um, he had told that he didn't ever wanna see a cigarette butt in a urinal. And um, 
he found he found somebody was putting cigarette butts in the urinals. And so his tactic to find out who did it is he went on and he said he was doing a survey and kids were allowed to smoke at camp. That wasn't an issue, but he was doing a survey and he said, well, he said, I just want to know what are the most popular cigarettes that you want in a vending machine that I'm going to buy for you guys to be able to buy your cigarettes here. Well, that was a ploy to find out who was smoking Lucky Strikes. And there happened to be only one kid that had requested that. And so he got in big trouble. And I think he was out digging stumps and maybe carrying dirt from a mile away to put in new grassy areas that were being established. Hey, Kay, this is Frank. We have a, a question from Ed May via the chat. Were the cabins used for other purposes during the remainder of the year when the camps were not running? No, no, they were closed down for the winter and the whole camp was shut down. Power turned off everything. Now today at the Discovery Center, you can you can stay in them. They're very, they're very much dressed up. We're coming on to 50 minutes. Um, we usually keep this to an hour. We can take another question or two if you'd like. Um, but I want to thank Kay for all the hard work she did. And I apologize that we tried to put those videos in and they seem to block the audio. Uh, they're great videos, by the way, and we'll make them available in uh, future presentations. Other yeah, questions? Good. good work, Kay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, I will, this is Frank Leonardi. I'll let everyone know that we are recording this session and uh, we will post it on our YouTube site uh, very soon. And we will put a Facebook post out to let everybody know that uh, it's out there and live, and then we'll uh, we'll figure out how to do the uh, little inset videos uh, under separate cover in some way. Well, goodbye, everybody, and thanks for tuning in. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>